All right, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Take out your notebook and whiteboard. Let's go. We got things to do. No, I'm going to finish. Well, not at this rate, but... Notebook, whiteboard. What? Yeah, thanks, buddy. We can fix it. All this can be fixed. Okay, here we go. Friendly reminder. Tomorrow you have a test. It'll be 30 minutes. It'll be 30 minutes this week and 30 minutes next week. Then if I think we're ready, we'll cut down to 29 minutes and we'll stay there for two weeks. And then we'll cut down to 28. We're just getting down to 27. If we don't practice for it, then you won't be ready on May 12th. Can we agree? So if we practice for it, you will be successful. All right. Uh, you have a focus and a, pri a map due tomorrow. Your primary is already online. It's kind of a big deal. It's fine. Um, so please make sure you have your assignments in. And yes. A uh, friendly reminder, on Thursday, I'm lecturing. Because I'm not here Friday. On Friday, you'll do the map without me. Does that make sense? So, no, it's amazing. And I'm not going to think about you and don't think about me. <laughs> so, uh, Thursday, I'm lecturing. It, we are starting Cold War, which is pretty cool. So, this is like the first time I'm really teaching Cold War. I used to just teach it as like a blip. We're breaking up into four weeks of content. Like, this is going to be cool. I'm, like, super excited because this is, like, new content for me. So I've learned so much already because I never really had to teach it in the in-depth style that I'm teaching it now. So this is pretty cool. All this other stuff, I keep cutting off things that I know and I'm, like, minimizing. Now I'm, like, learning so much stuff, so that's really cool. I know you don't care, but I want you to know I'm learning to you. Um, so please keep in mind, so we start Cold War on Thursday. I'm lecturing because I'm not here on Friday. You'll do the map without me on Friday. All right, questions, concerns, comments. Do you have a test tomorrow? 25 questions, all multiple choice. Quentin, that can't possibly be a good idea. Yes, Lily. You will not have a vocab quiz until Monday. You only have two vocab quizzes this week. I think it would be really rude for me to bump it up. You guys deserve a night with no homework. So I'm not going to give you one on Thursday. So um, you won't have a vocab quiz until Monday. You'll only do 10 instead of 15. Mia, did you have a question? Huh? That was my question. Oh, nice. Yeah. You don't have any vocab until Monday. I thought that was fair. Thank you. If I get to live my best life, you should have a little bit of shine, don't you think? All right. Here we go. All right. So who can raise your hand and tell me where we left off? What do you got? Hila. The Pacific meter. Yes. Talking about Japan. He broke the code. Oh, okay. So, the code of the Pacific is magic. Did I tell you that? What? The code for the Pacific for the Japanese is called magic. Like that's what we call the code. In Europe, um, Hitler's uh, code is called Enigma. In case you care. Um, so, when we talk about, and I do want to go back and kind of clarify your notes. Can we go back to where Hitler is going to invade Poland in 1941? Yes, are you at that place in your notes? Hello? Hitler invades. Uh, you need to know Operation Barbosa is what Hitler calls. That's his code name for the invasion of the Soviet Union. So, when Hitler invades the Soviet Union in 1941, on June 22nd, 1941. You need to know Hitler's code name is Operation Barbosa. If I'm being this specific, do you think there's a reason? Yeah. Yeah. What day? Uh, it's uh, June 22nd, 1941. It's like June 22nd, 1811 when Napoleon tried. It's not. Operation Barbosa. B-A-R-B-O-S-S-A. -S okay, so that's what he calls it. Okay. A couple things I do want to clarify. Um, reasons why the United States win the war, and you need to know this. I do want to add, maybe go, you can go back to the end of the notes where we pick up anyway. I know we'll pick up at Pacific here in a second, but a couple of things you definitely need to know. The reason why America wins a war is really two points. Spoiler alert, we win. 
The, anyone know why we won the war? If you think about it logically, it makes sense why we won the war and Germany doesn't. And there's a couple of reasons why. Ryan? Because uh, Germany was fighting on two fronts and they were like totally splitting their armies. Oh, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Yes, that is one of the reasons why Germany loses the war. But why does America win the war? You see the difference? Okay, because you're completely right. If we were looking at reasons why Germany loses the war, it's the introduction of the Second Front, which is against Russia. But why does America win the war? Logan. There you go. What is completely intact throughout the whole war? America. Industry. Okay, our factories are in production the whole time, and that's the biggest thing. Because when we're bombing... Cities, are we just bombing residential buildings? No. Are residential get buildings getting blown up? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, are, is that the main target? No. no, we're trying to blow up munition factories. We're trying to blow up uh, places where they're processing food. We're trying to shut down their ability to wage war. The reason why America wins the war is two major things. The first one is our factories remain intact the whole time, which means Two major things, okay? The reason why we win the war is we're able to outproduce every other country. Okay, D-Day for instance, the code name for D-Day is overload. Why? True. Because we bombed that. Huh? Because we bombed that. No, we don't actually bomb too much of it. Logan. <coughs> Yeah, there's a million people in movement, there's boats, there's ships. Um, we're going to overload Germany with the amount of uh, planes, air support, tanks, people, supplies. It is the largest collection of blood donations in the history of the world. For all the blood transfusions that were happening on trying to save those boys' lives, it's the largest blood collection in the history of the world. That's what we mean when we start talking about uh, overproduction. The, our ability to produce is going to be the other. Second thing is, is that we lose practically no civilians in the war. Why? Yeah, the war is fought overseas. It's not fought in our backyard. So the reason we're able, able to outproduce is because our factories are completely intact the whole time. In every other country, they're the first things getting blown off the map. The second reason is we're losing very little civilians. Why does that have an impact? Think about it. It makes perfect logical sense. More people, more people to enlist in the war. Another major reason is what, Kirsten? Our workers? Yeah. All of our workers are fully, fully functioning in these factories, which means we can continue to produce, which means we can continue to build the bombs, build the planes, build the aircraft carriers. Okay. Getting back to the Pacific Front. You need to know the United States is getting their butt kicked for the first two years. We talked about that, yes? Okay. In the Pacific, why are we getting our butt kicked for two years? Zach? Uh, because we have to travel all the way over there. No, we have the, uh, we have the canal. What is the canal? Panama Canal. That canal is in place, so we do have that. So it's not like we have to go on the tip of Africa. Uh, tip of Africa. Oh God. Tip of South America. Uh, Megan, what? Um, because Japan blew up like a bunch of the, like, pretty much all of the naval. Yeah. Um, Pearl Harbor was the heart of our Pacific fleet, and a lot of it gets destroyed. Was it unrecoverable? No. Most of it we can actually re do uh, fix and actually implement back in the war, and that was a huge point of pride for the United States. The second thing is, is that the United States did not plan for war well. Well, the FDR has a famous quote, while the rest of the world is building bombs, we're building automobiles. So in order to get the American war machine going, it takes time. And during that time, the Japanese and the Germans are kicking our butts. Okay, so you need to know that the Japanese, you also need to know the Japanese have 14 aircraft carriers and the United States join with seven. Two of them get knocked out really quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, aircraft carriers are the heart and soul of Navy success. And this war is going to cement that. Today, do we build more bombers or aircraft carriers? 
aircraft carriers. We don't even build gunships anymore. All we practically build, really, that we are aware of as civilians is submarines and aircraft carriers because the war in the Pacific is fought with aircraft carriers and submarines. So those are the big things. Now, a couple things you need to know about aircraft carriers. At the beginning of the war, they were only able to hold small planes who could only carry a small payload of bombs. These small payload of bombs could not go more than 25 to 50 yards, not yards, that would be stupid, 25 or 50 miles out in order to make the return trip out. So are we doing really heavy bombing off of these planes? No. By the end of the war, we're able to get B-52 bombers. These are the planes you think about that open their payload and you just see a massive stream of bombs falling, yes? Those are your B-52. Those are the ones that are super high up, your high level bombings, and those are the ones that are responsible for carpet bombing essentially cities. When you think of like a couple places get bombed, those are your smaller bombers, don't ask me the names. When you think of whole cities getting destroyed by bombers, those are B-52s. It's the Doolittle Raid, you don't need to know that, um, that is going to convert after, the, um, after Pearl Harbor. Now, the most important part of the Pacific War is airstrips, and you need to know that. The most important part of the war in the Pacific is controlling airstrips. Because with an airstrip, you can take off B-52 bombers, which they can do the high-level bombing, which can blow entire cities off the map. There are only two islands at the time that are not controlled directly by Japan or the United States, Pearl Harbor. Uh, the, uh, the islands of Hawaii have airstrips, as well as Japan's islands have airstrips. There's only two other ones in the whole Pacific, and that is at Midway and Iwo Jima. And you need to know it. I-W-O space J-I-M-A. Iwo Jima. Those are the two islands that have airstrips. Guess what are the two deadliest battles in the Pacific? Iwo Jima and Midway. Yes. I-W-O space J-I-M-A. Well, Japan has airstrips, but obviously we are not dealing with those. We have airstrips in Pearl Harbor, which we're not. The only two major ones that are up for grabs are at Midway and Iwo Jima. Those happen to be the two deadliest because everyone needs those airstrips in order to do major high-level bombings. Okay, what do you got? Yes. After the war, because keep in mind, the British are fighting for their homes. The French don't even have a home <laughs> until the last like eight months of the war, uh, last year of the war. Um, Germany is not really involved because they're getting their butts kicked, okay? And they're taking over the rest of the world, especially after the first two years. So it's really just America versus, versus Japan. Now, once we win, we start pulling. Now, the British are going to send the Australians. We do fight the war with a bunch of Australians and their British colony, but they're, they're also heavily invested because the Japanese are taking over some of their islands as well. True. But they don't have like the not major resources like England does, does that make sense? They have some, but Britain's also keeping all the bombs and stuff like that, and they're not fully industrialized at that point. What do you got, Drew? Uh, they're just getting murdered by Japanese people. And Americans, because we're blowing up islands and stuff, but... The Japanese have taken over and done all that stuff. That's a nice question. Thank you for asking about that. Yeah, no, not a dark time. Dark time. All right. So, in the Pacific, as we just talked about, the two major battles are Iwo Jima and Midway. They're the two deadliest conflicts because of the airships on the islands. The airships were needed for high-level bombing. Okay? The, at the Battle of Midway, that is the official turning point of the war, and you need to know that. It's also very easy to remember. Midway, turning point, I think it's very easy to remember. Okay? At the Battle of Midway, you need to know that the Japanese are going to lose two aircraft carriers. No, four, four, four. Damn it, four. Isn't that insane? In one battle? It's because we did some, like, tricky maneuvers, and we, uh, we got them. Don't ask me what those maneuvers are. That, 
The military component of things is not my forte. I'm more of the po a political side. Um, but yeah, so we do some fancy stuff, and then ta-da, we sunk them. So that's pretty cool. Like, we hide behind the island, then come out and surprise them, and then pew, pew they sink. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that's what happened. So you're welcome. Now, the Battle of Midway is going to be the turning point. The Battle of Iwo Jima gives us a airstrip that allows us to directly bomb Tokyo. And that, one, that is the reason why that one was so hard fought. Obviously, airstrips are very high commodities, but the fact that Iwo Jima is close enough that you can do high-level bombing to Japan is the major reason why that is such a big deal. Jolie. I'm sorry, Battle of Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima it allows for the United States to bomb Japan directly, Tokyo specifically. Samuel. I assume that's where they launched off a lot of the bombs for like Iwo Jima and Nagasaki. Yes, there. they're all going to leave out of uh, I'm like 90%. 90. Come on, Joe. Uh, weren't we going to bomb Tokyo first, first? Yeah, we bombed them a little bit, but we're using the smaller plant. Yeah. With the airstrip of Iwo Jima, we're able to do the high level, high capacity bombing, which is like we're really carpet bombing and like really so blowing city. We Okay, we go for Hiroshima because we're not trying to wipe off more than 100,000 citizens at a time. Does that make sense? Tokyo is the highest density city, so not the best look, right? So we target Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of the war because those are the two major refueling stations of the Japanese Navy. So they are military targets, not civilian targets. But during the war, we are gonna blow up parts of Tokyo. We're just not gonna wipe it off the map in one bomb, but we are gonna blow it up as like, morality and kind of like show them that we can. The Doolittle Raid is the first time we actually hit Tokyo directly. All right, you need to know the term, Douglas MacArthur. He is our general in the Pacific. Now someone asked me last period, why do we call it theaters? We call them theaters because they're two separate entities. We have a general in Europe and who is it? Starts with an E, Eisenhower. He's the brains behind D-Day. Okay, and then we have General MacArthur, who is the general of the Pacific. They don't really interact at all. They're not really even sharing resources. So that's why we have two separate theaters. What do you got? Does MacArthur do political What do you mean? Like Eisenhower versus MacArthur? Uh, no, MacArthur is going to have the weight of the world on his shoulders, and he really focuses on the rebuilding of Japan at, during our occupation of seven years after the war. Um, General MacArthur is directly involved in the dropping of the bomb, of the atomic bombs. It is MacArthur who is the first American to touch uh, Japanese soil after the bombs. And the weight that he feels from it is something you know, he said he would never recover. So he has a lot of that weight. Eisenhower is an American hero because he defeated the Nazis and stuff like that, D-Day, all of that stuff. So he doesn't have that kind of weight to him. Does that make sense? Truman calls for the bomb, but it is actually I, uh, MacArthur who coordinates the dropping and the coordination. It's MacArthur who makes the suggestion, and it's Truman who makes the call. Do we see the difference? It is MacArthur who says, this is our really only option, and this is why. So he's the real player. Just like today with the president, the generals show up, and they say, this is what we suggest. So we have your blessing, president, Mrs. President one day uh and there we go huh <coughs> yes ryan um uh so like when he made the call did he understand like the kind of destruction to a degree he saw a bombing uh, he saw examples of its fury in the, in the desert he saw it but i mean that was just model have you ever seen the model homes get blown up yeah it's just weird <laughs> Okay, MacArthur, you need to know, he's the Pacific Front, you need to know island hopping. Island hopping is the American strategy of skipping some islands and conquering others to save American lives. And you cannot mention the Pacific Theater without saying MacArthur and island hopping. 
This was like a 50-50 success rate. It was either gonna work or it wasn't going to. If you're thinking, well, of course you would do island hopping, why wouldn't you? No, it's actually a terrible strategy. When you're in the military, you don't want to have any enemy behind the lines, correct? Well, if you're island hopping, you have lots of enemies behind the lines. It's not ideal. Um, and that's why it was a real danger. But in order to save American Marine lives, they decided not to try to conquer every island because they were losing thousands of boys on every island trying to reconquer, which as soon as our SAMA really gets going in Band of Brothers, it's a lot of death. And a lot of those boys are not going to make it. And it is so good. And you won't be able to sleep and hear crickets without thinking of death. All right. Oh, my God. It is so crazy. There's like a four-minute scene. No, like four or six-minute scene of Band of Brothers where the screen is just dark. And it's just like a massacre of people. And when the light, when the dawn rises... Okay. Turning points of the war. Okay, you need to know, final years. D-Day, we've already talked about D-Day, yes? Okay, we talked about how it leads to the Battle of the Bulge, yes? Okay, so, the United States goes to Africa, Italy, then France, yes? Those are our points of attack. Once we win D-Day, uh, mission overload, once we win, we are going to push our way to Germany Hitler's final stand is going to be at the Battle of the Bulge. This is Hitler's last stand, and he will lose. Then we're on a foot race to Berlin. We want to get there before the Soviets, because whoever gets to the city first wins. Guess who wins? The Soviets win, and that's why they get to call the shots, which is why the Cold War is such a shit show. Okay, yes. Aladdin. Okay. Battle of Kursk is the last big Soviet German battle. This is the last stand the Germans do against the Soviets. The Soviets are obviously going to win. Fun fact four days after the Battle of Kursk is when the Soviets walk into Auschwitz. Because Auschwitz is in Poland. After they win the Battle of Kursk, as they start pushing towards Germany, that's when they find Auschwitz. Um, we know Stalin knew about the war, but just like us, we, the regular population, the soldiers had no idea these places existed. Can you remember, imagine the horrors of walking upon that? Now keep in mind, oh, we're going to get there. What do you got? Why did you say Poland? Because Jew Poland has a ton of Jews. They have like three concentration camps. Poland actually had one of the largest Jewish populations. Had is the operative word. What do you got? Um, what's the difference between the Battle of the Bulge and the Allies? Um, they're the last stands of Hitler. One's for the Soviets, Kursk. One is for the Allies. Okay. Uh, victory in Europe is going to officially happen on May 8th, 1945. Hitler is going to kill himself on April 30th. The Germans officially surrender on the 8th. Do not give me conspiracy theories that Hitler lived in Brazil until the end of his life. Okay, I just can't. I just can't. Have you read that already? No, every year it comes up. No, because I try to head off as many of the conspiracy theories as possible. Okay, so the war in Europe ends on May 30th, 1945. The war in the Pacific is going to keep going until September 2nd, 1945. Okay, and that is after we drop two atomic bombs because the Japanese would not surrender. Okay, you need to know that 75 million people are going to die in World War II. Two thirds of them are civilians. It is the deadliest conflict in human history. It is the deadliest war in human history. When we say war, we're talking soldiers killing soldiers. When we say deadliest conflict, we're talking about soldiers and civilians. It is the deadliest conflict and it is the deadliest war in history. You need to know that the World War II directly causes the Cold War. Okay, mass atrocities is your headache. Okay, you need to know that Russia has more dead than any other country. Why? 
It's a hot mess. <laughs> okay, the Russians lose more people than anyone else. Hey, someone was like, well, isn't it their fault? A good part of it is their fault. Yes, yes, you are right. Uh, but it's also Hitler's. It's also the conditions. It's also, you know, a lot of theirs. Okay, you need to know that the Americans lose the least amount. Why? Makes sense. Perfect logical sense. Why, Samuel? Uh, because we're not fighting it on our territory. We're fighting it. <laughs> Yeah, we have very few civilians. Every other country has huge civilian casualties. We have very few. We also join the war late. Keep that in mind as well, and that does play a factor as well. Okay, suffering. Here we go. Holocaust. Okay, you need to know that the Holocaust is going to be led by Henrik Himmler. Now, of course, this is all Hitler's idea, correct? Okay, but it is Himmler who implements. This is in no way a positive, but it's an incredibly effective system. Can we agree? We know by finding out names exactly where people were moved and how they died because the Germans kept such detailed records. That's how effective this system is. Six million Jews are going to die. Five million other people are going to die in these concentration camps or during this Holocaust. Of course, the greatest atrocities of this war are going to be on the Jewish people. Of course, the other people who are going to die are gypsies, people who are suffering from physical handicaps, mental illness, Anyone who stands on the sides and helps the Jews try to escape, those types of people. So it's not just Jews, but by far the largest and most targeted group are the Jews. But it is not just Jews. So 11 million people are going to die in the Holocaust. It is important to me that you know that the Holocaust was so important to Hitler that while Hitler was losing the war, okay, he refused to move assets and soldiers out of the concentration camps to fight, but kept them there to keep killing Jews. So what was more important to him? Killing Jews or winning the war? Killing Jews. That is absolutely horrifying to me. A man who has based everything off the glory of war would rather spend his last few days killing as much Jews as possible. That is how deeply corrupted the Nazis were and how disgusting the Holocaust was. Now, you do need to know the Holocaust is referred to as the final solution. That is an important term that you need to know. And this was supposed to eradicate Jews from the planet. Yes? Uh, so, I was, I was just going to ask you this sure. before this, but uh, so the Holocaust and the final solution, we have the same thing. Yeah, they're the same thing. The Holocaust is supposed to be the final solution of eradicating Jews. Instead of dealing with Jews, we can just get rid of them completely. That was the plan, which is why we have a systematic destruction of the Jewish people. Um, almost. Okay, so almost, because they obviously didn't get them. All right, so that's the Germans. The Japanese. You need to know that the Japanese are committing atrocities against the Chinese people, okay, just senseless murdering. Uh, they are going to commit uh, comfort women of Korea. The raping of Neijing is another term for it. They're going to kidnap women to girls. I'm talking six years old, capture them, gang rape them, molest them, murder them, maim them, for the ideas of saying thank you to the soldiers for their hard work. That's what's happening in Japan. It is commissioned and condoned by the Imperial Guards. Now, they're also doing atrocities against the Chinese. Um, there's a couple of cases where they purposely just light people like massive towns and on fire just to watch people burn. Pretty terrible stuff. Also important to note, the Allies are also committing atrocities. 
Okay, do the victors go to the spoils? Yes, we heard us talk about that. So do we usually talk about the terrible things that the winners do? No, but we're gonna acknowledge it. Obviously the atomic bomb is going to wipe off two cities off the planet, yes? Those are some pretty horrible atrocities. We're also gonna firebomb, okay? Um, Dresden, we're gonna firebomb uh, Hamburg and Tokyo. And most of those are gonna kill about 100,000 people. Okay, so there are atrocities happening on all sides. Okay, now it is important for you to know that the Holocaust is going to lead to two promises. Okay, the first promise is that the whole world is going to say that another genocide will never occur. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what is a lie? <laughs> that a gen another genocide will not occur. Another <laughs> genocide happens within 20 years, another one happens in about 40 years, and then we have one currently going on and everyone is allowing this to happen. It's ha currently happening in China where they are putting Muslims in concentration camps and executing them in the same exact style that they are doing in World War II and the Holocaust. Yet we're sending Olympians to China. Moving forward. The second thing that the Holocaust is going to do is motivate Western powers, England, France, and the United States to create the state of Israel as an apology for not doing more to prevent the Holocaust. How does that go? It's not great, okay? There's obviously two sides to it, can we agree? Which we're gonna get into over and over again for the next seven weeks of content. First thing is, I think we can all agree, after the atrocities of the Holocaust, we'd wanna do whatever we could to try to make it back to Owe it back to the Jews, yes? Because keep in mind, England, France, United States all knew of the atrocities that were happening and they didn't do anything. We have blood on our hands. So as an apology in 1947, in the first UN directive, we create the State of Israel. The problem is, with the creation of the State of Israel, we destabilize the entire Middle East. <laughs> okay? And the United States is going to be blamed entirely, which is going to force all the hatred on the United States, which is then going to lead to terrorism. Dun, 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 dun. And I would say terrorism has shaped your life more than any other cultural event. Would you agree? And that is what we're gonna get into really in the next 40, 50 years of content here in this class. So the Holocaust is having long lasting effects uh, with the creation of the state of Israel. So the intentions um, are of course good causes lots of complication, and you do need to have an opinion on the matter, because there is both good and bad when it comes to the creation of the state of Israel. Questions, concerns, comments, what do we think? Oh my god, ah, it's good for you. I'm so glad it took 47 minutes of this class to figure that out. Tell me, is this a new thought, or has been around for a while? So, I mean, keep in mind, the World War II directly causes the Cold War. Um, Stalin is pissed off that we didn't come to his aid immediately. Instead of going to Africa, he wanted us to come and help them. The second major stain is instead of going, starting D-Day, he wanted aid to come directly to Russia. And then hit, uh, Stalin doesn't find out about our atomic bomb until the Potsdam Conference about six months before we dropped the bomb, and that does not make him happy because Churchill knew about the bomb for about four years. So, Woski Broski, to the boards, friends, to the boards. On your whiteboard, what is the name of the turning point, uh, turning event of the Pacific? Good, Carson. Battle of Midway, on your whiteboard. There are two islands with airstrips, which are also the hardest fought battles in the Pacific. What are those two islands? What do you got, Quentin? Midway and Iwo Jima. Midway and Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima gives us the opportunity to do high-level bombings on what location? Good, Ryan. Tokyo, on your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the last stand of Hitler after D-Day from the Allies. Full effort here. 
I mean, oh, Battle of the Bulge. What is Hitler's last stand with the Soviets? Good. What is it, Jordan? Battle of Kursk on your whiteboard. Please tell me, where's the first place the Allies go when America joins the war? George, what's the second place we go? What do you got, Zach? Italy. Italy. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What year does the war end, both in the Amer uh, Pacific and European front? Manuela, 1945. What year does America get pulled in? Good. We got Gila. Forty-one. We typically fight four years every time we join a war. We typically, America has a knack for doing things in four years. The only real exception is World War One. We only fight two years. But Civil War, four, two, four. Now that's us. The rest of Europe's been fighting for a long time. Six years. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the date of Pearl Harbor? Well, at least we know it's 41, right, Gila? Yeah. Nice. What do we got? You have nothing there. <laughs> what do you got, Ryan? Do you have December 7, 1941 or just 41? Well, there's a whole year, dude. <laughs> On your whiteboard, please tell me. Who's the dude behind the Holocaust? Obviously, Hitler is the guy who comes up with the plan, but who's the guy who implements the plan? What do we got, Owen? Himmler. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is it called when a nation devotes all of its resources to winning a war? That is both civilian and infrastructure. What do we got, Mia? Total war. What is it called when the government begins limiting civilian access in order to send more rash? Damn it. More food to the front. Damn it, Megan. Rashing. On your whiteboard, please tell me. That was a good question, too. On your whiteboard. Goodbye. <laughs>